God is good. It's good to see everyone today. God is on the throne. See, the enemy's out there wreaking havoc. He's doing what he does. And we're going to see that here in a second as a reminder that uh, the devil is in the, you know, he's, he's in the business of doing some things. And I just want to remind everyone of who's behind all the nonsense that we are experiencing out there, right? We're experiencing all kinds of different things that are happening out in the world, tragedy and these uh, horrible things that are happening out there on a daily basis. Not just here in our area, but all over the world. The enemy is wreaking havoc. The enemy is wreaking havoc right now. And uh, I just want to remind everyone, it's, God is, is on the throne, and it's not that God is sleeping or God is not doing anything. We need to understand some spiritual things. And as we understand spiritual things, and we understand what is actually happening uh, uh, and why, uh, we'll understand why it's happening, you know, and you've got to go back to the Garden of Eden, right? You've got to go back to the Garden. God created man, right, in His image, and man was in his presence on a daily basis. That's what Eden represents, being in the presence of God on a daily basis. And so man, when he was created, he was in God's presence on a daily basis. God walked with man. Read the book of Genesis. You'll see that God was there in the presence of man on a daily basis. But man decided to do his own thing and not follow God's instructions. And you know what's interesting is in that garden, God had said, you can do whatever you want in here, you can eat whatever you want in here, just don't do this one thing. Just one. And what was that? To eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Right? Now, what we need to understand is, all, all that God did was simply give us a choice. That's all He did. To either follow His instructions... Or not follow his instructions, right? He gave us a choice. That choice still exists for you and I today, right? We have a choice to follow God's instructions, God's plan for our life, or to do our own thing. No different than when Adam and Eve was in the garden. We still have choice today. But for Adam and Eve, they were in the garden. They decided to, to do what God said not to do, which was go and eat from that tree. And then what happened was God called them on it. Right? And instead of doing what? We all have been there, right? We've either been on the, the receiving end of this or we've been on the end of why did you do it, right? Right? Get your hand uh, uh, caught. You got caught with your hand in the cookie jar. Let's put it that way. You get caught doing something. And you have the perfect opportunity to say, you caught me. You got me. But what did Adam and Eve not do. They didn't take responsibility for their actions is what they did not do. Therefore, sin is born, right? That's when sin was born. Man failing to take responsibility for his actions. And that's why we're in the mess we are today, right? But God is on the throne, and I want to just remind you that he still is on the throne, regardless of all the tragedy, regardless of all the nonsense that's happening, God is not asleep, right? God is not asleep. See, and then we've got to factor something else in there is that we sometimes make decisions and, and, you know, there's always consequences for our decisions, right? Whatever it may be. I'll use myself for example because I don't like picking on nobody, right? So I go and I have that second helping of food, that second serving. I go back and have uh, an extra dessert and I do this. What's going to happen? You're going to be in sugar bliss. But at the same time, what ends up happening right here? Oh, right? Unless you have a, you know, a body that's just a, you know, a, a, a calorie burning machine, right? You can just put whatever you want in it and it's just going to continue to burn it off, right? You don't even have to do anything. But the point is, is there's consequences for our actions, amen? And so we need to understand that. And once we start having an understanding of how things operate on this earth, it gives us a better insight on, into why kind of things are the, the way they are today. But I want to encourage you this morning to know that God is on your side. And we're going to look at some things right here. Look at this 
verse right here, and we were actually in it on Wednesday, in, in John chapter 10, verse number 10. And I'm just going to open up in prayer as we get into the Word, right? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We dedicate it to you. We give you glory. We give you honor, Lord. Lord, we ask you to speak to our hearts and our minds today, Lord. Help us to understand your word. Give us a insight, a, a revelation, Lord. And Lord, we thank you that this word is sown on good ground, Lord. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen and amen. So look at here, John chapter 10, verse number 10. We looked at this on Wednesday, but we were actually looking at something entirely different. But we know that the Word is living. It's powerful. Amen? It's powerful. Thank you. The Word is living. It's powerful. So even though in, on Wednesday we were talking about guarding our hearts, you know, your spirit, be careful. Protect your, your heart. Right? But now we're going to look at it, at it in a different context here. Okay. John 10.10. 10. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. That's what the thief does. Right? That's what Satan does. He comes to steal, he comes to kill, and he comes to destroy. And this is what he's doing today on planet Earth. He's been doing it since the Garden of Eden. Right? He's been doing it since the Garden of Eden. But see, we need to be wise to his ways. See, we're so much better off today than Adam and, you know, Adam and Eve in the sense of God has already broken down everything for us. He's given us a, a, a blueprint on how to overcome the ways of the enemy. He's given us a blueprint, right? But the thing is this, is that oftentimes we lose sight of that. So we've got to understand here in verse 10, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. That's what he does. He's in the business of wanting to take from you what God has promised you. He wants to steal it from you, right? He wants to take that good life that God has promised, from you, promised you. He wants to steal your joy. He wants to steal your happiness and Sometimes he does a really good job at it when you let him. See, you got to decide, you know what, I'm not going to let the enemy steal my joy any longer. I'm not going to let him steal my happiness any longer. Right? you got to make a conscious decision to say, I'm not going to let you steal from me anymore, devil. Right? You're just not going to do it. you got to make that decision. See, because this is what he's in the business of doing is stealing from us. And then he's real good at using other people in our lives to do the same thing. Right? Let me show you and give you an example. Hold your place here in John. We will be coming back. But let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 15. 2 Samuel, Old Testament. So we need to understand that the enemy has, has started a system in some ways that many people follow. But we've got to know that where it ultimately comes from, it comes from Satan is where it comes from. And he uses people to get his dirty work done. And I'm going to show you an example right here in the second book of Samuel, chapter 15, where he does exactly that. So in 2 Samuel chapter 15, we're going to take a look here at verse 6, but before we go there, I just want to give you a little bit of a background. Now, we remember David, who was the second king over Israel, right? He had some sons. When he became king, he had a few wives, right? They were allowed to have multiple wives. We talked about that last week on Father's Day. I don't know why any man would want more than one wife. Do we need to camp out here for a minute? Remember last week we were looking at, at Solomon, who was actually uh, uh, one of David's sons. Solomon was the actual son who succeeded him to become king after David grew old and passed away. Solomon succeeded him and became king of Israel. But Solomon had, remember, how many wives did we say last week? 700 wives. 
and 300 concubines, which means another 300 ladies on top of the 700 that he was married to that he could have some intimate physical relationships with. How, how do you say that? I think you call it SEX today. On top of his 700 wives, right? So once again, I don't know why any man would want more than one wife. But David had a few. And one of his sons from one of his wives was named Absalom, right? Now, we need to understand that as David had a few sons, he could only have one of them succeed him, and the one who was going to succeed him on the throne was going to be the one that God had ordained, right? But sometimes people get ideas in their mind, and they say, you know what, I don't care what God wants, I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to be the next king, right? And so people take matters into their own hands, as his son Absalom did. Let's look at 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse number 6. And it says, In this manner, Absalom acted toward all Israel who came to the king for judgment. Okay, so in other words, people were going to see his father David to get counsel. This is what kings did, right? Besides eating uh, feast in their castles, they actually did some kind of stuff for the people. They ruled over certain matters that the people would have. If they had disagreements or, or somebody got caught doing something, they would say, hey, let's take them you know, to the king and see what we're going to do. So here people are going to see him. <coughs> and here Absalom is. And we're seeing here in verse 6, chapter 15. In this manner, Absalom acted toward all Israel... See, not just some people, but everyone, all, who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. You see what he was doing? He was plotting to be king, so how do you do it? Well, guess what? Let me get on the good side of these people, so they'll be on my side. They'll be behind me. So he started plotting to be the next king, by winning over the people. Where do you think Absalom got this evil idea from to plot against his father who loved him? Where do you think he just, just came from nowhere one day? Who is the father of lies? Satan is. Right? Satan's the father of lies. And this is where these ideas come from. And he gets people to run with his ideas all so easy. People fall prey to it all the time. If you're not careful, he can do this. So we see Absalom right here, that he was winning over the people. Right? Now, I'll give you just a, 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 little, a little nugget in this, right? Something about Absalom. Because some of you might go back and read chapter 15 or read chapter 14 to get more information. And you might come up with some ideas of, oh, I know why Absalom did it. Or I know why the people took his side. Right? Let's go to chapter 14. Let's look at verse number 25. Look at what verse 25 says about Absalom. Now in all Israel, there was no one who was praised as much as Absalom for his good looks. Good looking guy. Oh man. You know I read something a while back. I can't remember where I got this article from. But it talked about how they actually had, had did a, a study of some sort. And, and uh, you know they have actually proved that good looking people. And now whatever your definition is of good looking, right? We all have our own definition. Actually get treated better than bad looking people. <laughs> and I'll leave that to your definition. Bad looking people, right? Right? So they say that the, that, the, that, the, the, that the pretty people, the good looking people, they actually, you know, get treated differently, right? And I think I actually seen something where people, you know, actually did something like this. They, they did these little tests and they actually videotaped it where they went in you know, and seeing how people would treat them opposed to going in, you know, like maybe dressed all raggedy or something and showing like, you see how, how you, people treat you differently, right? So here Absalom, it tells us in, in chapter 14, verse 25, it says that 
he was good looking. Right? Doesn't hurt to be good looking, right? Get favor. Now, look at what it says. It says, from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. Guess the guy had no acne, no scars, right? Whatever, you, you know, no blemish, right? He didn't need his pictures to be photoshopped. Thank you. Filter, there you go. I know some of you guys on your social media make yourselves look to be like, wow. <laughs> right? You, you take away the blemishes. He didn't need that. It says right here in verse 25, it tells us that there was no blemish in him from the, it said, from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. So in other words, from top to bottom. The guy was just like, wow. Right? And let, let's read on. Look at verse 26, what it says. And when he cut his hair of his head, at the end of every year, he cut it because it was heavy on him. And when he cut it, he weighed the hair of his head at 200 shekels according to the king's standard. Now, I don't know about you, but you, you know what's funny is, um, have you ever, ever put anything on a scale that didn't weigh very much? The scale, like, won't read it. I have a digital scale, and it's funny. I was weighing my suitcase this morning, because you know there's a weight limit when you fly, uh, how much you can, your suitcase can weigh. And if it weighs over a certain limit, I think it's 40 pounds, you've got to pay for, uh, uh, you know, it's like paying for two bags, okay? So the point being is, I put it on the scale, and it's digital scale, and when I first put it on there, it wasn't moving. I'm like, hey, what's going on? So I had to kind of uh, 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 maneuver it to a different angle where it, you know, all the weight of the suitcase would be on the scale so it could register it. Oh, and there it went, 25 pounds. What do you have in there, Pastor? Books. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Believe it or not, clothes, the weight of the clothes, they, they, they add up that weight. But I share this with you because... It said that they weighed his hair and it was 200 shekels. I don't know what that measurement is. But that meant when he put his hair on the scale that it was, you know, it, it gave a measurement. How many of you could cut your hair today and put it on a scale and the scale will measure the weight of it? Probably most of us, that wouldn't happen. Because hair is not what? Very heavy. But can you imagine, this guy had, his hair was, was so heavy that it weighed 200 shekels. And it tells us here in verse 26 that his hair was heavy on him. I'm going to pick on my son Noah, he's a barber. Have you, weighed, have you ever cut anybody's hair at the barber shop that's so heavy that it might even weigh like say one pound maybe? Besides your brother Jacob. Jacob's a hairy guy. <laughs> he came out of the womb, his mother, Pastor Trish, needing a haircut when he was born. The, one of the first things I said when he came out, I'm like, man, he already needs a haircut. <laughs> He's been blessed with some good hair. Okay, getting back to Noah again, I didn't forget. Noah, have you ever cut anybody's hair that weighs like a pound or two? I don't know. Probably not. I'm sure you've probably cut somebody's hair that was like a lot of hair, but do you think it would weigh a pound? 16 ounces, right? Wow. He's still in thought. He'll tell, he'll tell us later. He's think, I caught him off guard. He's thinking about that. But I wanted you guys just to get a picture of how much or how heavy his hair was. So the point being is this. I just share this little bit with you about Absalom. Is The guy was a good-looking guy. And he probably had hair like a guy named Fabio. See, you younger generations, you don't know who that guy is. Fabio was a guy about around 20 years ago. He was a model, right? And he had this nice, tanned, chiseled body, you know, went to the gym, took care of himself. But he had this long hair, you know, just kind of like flowing, right? I think he's Italian, I don't know. Fabio, right? And he was like this, uh, you know... Um, what do they call it when, you know, everyone uh, likes their look or whatever? Uh, you know, 
he was just up there, one of the nice, or, or I'd say best looking guys or whatever. <laughs> of that time frame, right? So I, I'm just painting a picture for you of Absalom. See, it's one thing to try to plot against his father to steal the hearts of the people so he could become king, but he also had some things working for him. He was a good looking guy, right? He was a good looking guy. So you know what? That didn't help. That didn't hurt him. You had something? Did I hear something? No? I'm, I'm hearing things today. Must have been the Holy Spirit. Absalom was a good looking guy. He had that going in his favor. So, so once again, but with all that being said, he was doing something very wrong. He was plotting against his father, trying to become king and taking you know, the, the kingdom away from his dad. It didn't work. If you go on and read more about Absalom, you'll see that he did, David found out about it, and his heart was broken that his son plotted to basically try to do this to him. And so Absalom had raised up some men to follow him to fight against his father, and you know, his father was the you know, chief uh, uh, commander over all the army of Israel, right? And his father was so heartbroken, but when they had to deal with the situation and they had to go and, you know, uh, try to get Absalom, he told his men, don't kill him. Don't kill him. Even though he was hurt, he's like, you know, that's my son. I couldn't hurt him, right? But moving on, let's go back to chapter 10 of John 10. We'll... Hoo-hoo! Did you guys hear that? 200 shekels was the weight of Absalom's hair that we read in 2 Samuel chapter 10, verse 26. And today's measurement of 200 shekels, that would equal 5 pounds. Maybe he didn't wash his hair for a while. Maybe there was some other things in his hair. <laughs> Five pounds of hair? Wow, that one right there baffles me, right? So Fabio had nothing on him. Let's go back to John chapter 10, verse 10. We read the first part. The thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. But see, now he has people doing the same thing. We've seen how Absalom was trying to, he did steal some hearts of the people from his father, right? Today, there's people out there doing the same thing, stealing, killing, and destroying, right? These are works of the enemy, period, because this is not what God does. Let me show you the rest of verse number 10 here that we didn't finish. This is Jesus speaking. He says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. You see that? Jesus says, I came to give life life, and that we have it more abundantly. What does that mean to have it more abundantly? Right? Well, how about, you know, God wants us to have a life where we're happy. Because I know that there's some people today that are living life and they're not happy. I was speaking with somebody recently and they told me, I'm not happy with my life. That hurt me to hear that. Because Jesus said that he wants us to have an abundant life. Now why are, or why is anyone not having an abundant life? Why are they not ha happy? Why are they not having a happy life? Right? Why are they not experiencing joy and peace in their life. Because we need to understand that in order to experience all that God has for us, there are some things that we have to do to help our situation out. What do we have to do, Pastor? I'm glad you asked that question. Let's go to verse number 9. We're still in chapter 10. Let's go to verse 9. Jesus says right here in John 10, 9, I am the door. And if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out of 
the pasture, P-A-S-T-U-R-E. You know where the sheep go out and they graze, right? And so Jesus is giving us an analogy here of how life would be in the safety, right, of being, you know, following his plan. There's peace and safety for the sheep here he's talking about in the shepherd's care. See, when we're in obedience to God and following His instructions and His plans for our life, there's peace and safety in that. But see, the minute that we get out of His care and we say, yeah, you know what, Gee, I, I'm tired of you know, this kind of thing right here. I'm going to go have some fun over here. Let me go see what's going on over here. He's going he's gonna to let you. He gave us free will. And the minute we come over here and out of His safety and care, now, guess what? He doesn't want anything to harm us, but He's got to allow us to do whatever it is we want to do because He gave us free will. So as much as He doesn't want anything to happen to us, He's got to stand by and say, well, I've got to honor their decision. Right? It's no different than we as parents when our kids, you know, get older and they leave the house and they start making their decisions. We may not agree with their decisions, but guess what? They're now grown. And we have to stand by and watch the decisions they make, whether we agree with them, whether we like them or not, because they're now their own persons. Now, when they're those little children like running around, yeah, we get to make decisions for them, like choosing what clothes they're going to wear today. That's a whole other story. I don't want to get into that. We choose for them what they're going to eat what time they go to bed. You know, the list goes on. We make those decisions for them every day. But at some point when they get older, they make the decisions for themselves and we got to trust that we did the best we could to instill good values in them that they're going to make good decisions. But if they don't, we have no control. But you do have something available to you. You could pray for them. Amen? So when people leave the safety and care of the shepherd, right, now they're kind of on their own. They, 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 they leave the hand of protection. See, because we've said it before, this, this, the Bible tells us we cannot serve two masters. Because the Word says you're going to either love the one and hate the other. You can't be serving God and serving Satan at the same time. You've got to choose one or the other. And I've said it before, we can believe in God all we want, but if we want to go and do the devil's business, there's going to be consequences. That's just the way it is. Now, we could talk about, well, hey, I believe in God, but, you know, I, I give in to my temptation sometimes. We all do. Does that mean you're going to lose your salvation? No, that doesn't mean you're going to lose your salvation. That just means you're going to have to deal with the repercussions of your decisions here on earth, Right? But thank God that we don't lose our salvation, right? Because if you read the Scriptures, He says there's very simple requirements to being saved. Amen? And I thank God for that. I thank God that He doesn't say, well, you know what? You weren't good today, so you're not going to heaven. Can you imagine if He were to tell us that? But see, our God is a good God. Amen? Our God is a good God. Now, I know there's some people out there, they talk about, you know, uh, uh, you can lose your salvation. But I've read the Bible and I've never come to that part where it says that you could lose your salvation. It doesn't say that there. Right? Read the Bible. Now, I do believe that for a person who believes in God and has salvation, I do believe that they can get out of the you know, protection of God and put themselves in a bad situation and deal with some dire consequences. I do believe that. It happens. Right? But that's a whole other message right there about salvation. Right? But I, ask, I encourage you, read the Bible. Our God is a good God. He's a merciful God. But at the same time, you know, He gives us the opportunity to follow Him and we have to learn to be obedient to Him. Let's go to the 
John 14, and let's go to uh, verse 45. And I'm just going to give you a few scriptures here before we wind down. John 14, verse number... Did I say John 14, 45? Oh, there's no verse 45. I'm testing you. 15, I believe it is. Give me... I think it's 15. 15, yeah. John 14, 15. Look at what Jesus says right here in verse 15. If you love me, Jesus is asking us the question, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. It's a very strong point he's making right there. Talking about obedience. Right? Talking about obedience. Because obedience flows from the heart. Right? It flows from the heart. It's, it flows from a heart that has gratitude. A heart that understands what He's done for us. And we just say, you know what? You went to that cross in my place, Jesus. You, you died for my sins. You gave me a, 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 an eternal uh, you know, uh, life. Man, the least I can do is live for you, Lord. That's the least I can do for you. Let me show you something that even goes back to the Old Testament. Let's go to Genesis 22. And we're going to go to verse 18. Now, this scripture is talking about Father Abraham, but it applies. And I just want to show you something here. So in Genesis chapter 22, verse number 18, look at what it says. The Lord is telling Abraham this. He's saying, in your seed... All the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Do you see that right there? How obedience brings rewards. And that goes back to the Old Testament. Let's go to the Gospel of Luke chapter 11. And we're going to go to verse number 28. Luke 11. Verse number 28. Look at what the word says right here. But he said, this is what Jesus, but he said, more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. There's another translation in the New Living Translation that says this, blessed are those who hear the word of God and put it in to practice. Think about that for a second. See, the Word of God tells us that when we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, we are going to experience so much better than when we're just doing things our way. Can I get an amen? And I want to encourage you. Continue to put in the effort to try to do what the Lord would have you to do every day. So that you can start to experience these things that we're seeing here from His Word. Because His Word does not return void. More than that, blessed are those who hear the Word of God and keep it. Or put it into practice. See, that, that's another step we've got to do. See, it's one thing to hear the Word of God, but then we've got to take it and we've got to practice it in our life. Amen. And when you start doing that, you're going to start seeing some way different results. And I want to encourage you, keep putting the Word of God into practice. Don't let it go in one ear and out the other. The book of James talks about a person like that. It says, be a doer of the Word, not just a hearer only. Right? Let's become doers of the Word. Let's become a people that put it into practice so that we can start experiencing more and more of the goodness of God in our lives. That way, the enemy cannot come and steal our joy anymore. He can't come and steal our peace anymore. Now, I'm not telling you that life is going to be but a... What's that song? A rose garden. Remember that song, You Never Promised Me uh, a Rose Garden? I think something where the words like... Is that how it goes? I can't remember all the words. I never promised you a rose garden. Yeah, that was the song. I'm not saying that if you follow the word to T, you're not going to ever have any problem in your life, but I will say this, you're going to be so much better off. 
You're going to be so much stronger. You're going to be so much built up in your faith that the enemy cannot steal your joy. He can't take your peace from you. And you're going to be able to just continue to just put your trust in God, continue to just give Him honor and glory, continue to lift Him up, right? When you're putting this into practice. Jesus said it in John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. I didn't see in there only the ones you like. Or I didn't see in there keep some of my commandments. He says keep my commandments. That means even the ones we don't like. But see the point is this. You will be better off for following his plan for your life. He says it in his word here. You will be blessed you will be blessed for following his word what did luke eleven twenty eight says blessed are those right who hear the word of god and keep it amen see so this is what we have to do so that the enemy cannot steal kill and destroy in our lives any longer amen see see you know evil can be happening all, all around us but guess what it don't have to be happening to you because the hand of God is over you and protecting you amen right you know in the, in the, in the word that it talks about I believe let me see here I believe it's in Psalm 91. It's a, it's a great psalm if you ever want uh, something to, to pray for protection over you, your home, your family you know pray this Psalm 91 and it talks about this protection from God. And look at what it says. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He's my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him I will trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. And He shall cover you with His feathers and under His wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destructions that lay waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. In other words, thank you for that, amen. Amen. See, destruction can be happening all around you. People can be falling, dropping like flies. But guess what? You're standing strong. Because the Lord is your refuge. Amen? See, the Lord honors His Word. But the minute that we get out of the, of the shepherd's protection, as we were seeing in the Gospel of John chapter 10, read that, that chapter that talks about listening to the shepherd and hearing His voice and knowing His voice. And as you continue to hear from God and, and, and know His voice and follow Him, you're going to be okay. It's when we're not doing those things. It's when we're not following Him and His plan. Amen? It's when we, we leave the sheepfold. It gives that analogy. We get away and we go do our own thing. That's when we put ourselves into trouble there. And see, that's why, you know, maybe you, you know, you're saying, Hey, Pastor, I, I'm good there. Well, guess what? Let's pray for those that aren't. Let's encourage those that aren't. Our, our family and our friends that are, that are away from the hand of protection from the Lord right now. You know, let's not get to the place where we're saying, hey, I'm good. You know, let's think about others. Because Jesus say, said the greatest commandment above all the two were to love Him with all your heart, soul, and mind and to love others as yourself. So let's be mindful of others. Amen. Let's be thinking about others. Let's be praying for them. Let's be encouraging them. Let's do our part. Because we see all this nonsense happening and the enemy is stealing, killing, and destroying. It's not going to stop. As a matter of fact, we see it intensified on planet Earth. We see these events happening more and more and it's not going to stop. So what do we do? Do you just stay in bed and put the covers over your head? Say, well, I'm not getting out of bed then. You know, no. We say, you know what, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something about this. You know, I'm going to do my part because, you know, I, I'm obedient to the Lord and He could use me. Amen? Oh, thank you, Lord. 
Read your Bibles. Then put it into practice. Put it to use. That's when you're going to start seeing the benefits of God's Word. Just like Luke is telling us, right? That you need to put it to practice. Thank you, Lord. If I can ask everyone to just bow their heads. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, we thank you for this time, Lord. And Lord, I thank you for your people, Lord. Lord, I pray for each and every one of them, Lord. I pray by faith that they would all become doers of the Word and not just hearers only, Lord. Lord, I would pray that they would get hungry for Your Word. Lord, I pray that they would want to just serve You and do something great for You and Your kingdom, Lord. Even if that meant that it would take some of their time, some of their resources, that maybe it may take them out of their comfort zone. Lord, I pray for Your people that they would want to just do greater things for You, Lord. That they would want to reach those that are not in the sheepfold. That they would want to go out there and help those that need to be helped. We know right now this is a very difficult times on planet Earth right now. But we know why it's difficult times. Because the enemy knows that You're soon to come for us. So he's trying to take as many people down with him as he can. Lord, let us have a sense of urgency in our hearts and our spirits, Lord, to want to do something great before you come, Lord. Lord, let us get out of our comfort zones. Let us be more about your business than about anything else, Lord. Lord, help your people. Let them see that there's something great at stake. Oh, Lord, I pray for your people today, Lord, that you would help them. That they could see that as they walk more in the obedience of God, that your hand will never leave protecting them. Just like Psalm 91 says, you will be our refuge. Lord, I pray for your people, Lord. Let them get it, Lord. Lord, we give you glory and honor in the precious name of Jesus. And everyone says, Amen and Amen. God is good. Amen.